Thank you, George. I, I never knew he played me on the vacation until tonight. <laughs> that's, that's, that's just brutal. Um, <laughs> George would also send you um, to an event in Kansas City and say, well, since you're out there, there's also something going on in Seattle. And then Los Angeles isn't far from there. And on the way back, well, you're practically in Chicago, so why don't you just cover the, the Cubs? I want to, there are a lot of things to thank George for, but tonight I want to thank the National Sports Media Association. Ever since Dave Gorin told me about this honor, I've been proud thinking about this night. Nothing means more in any pro uh, profession than recognition from your peers. It only makes it better when the other three being honored tonight are so distinguished. It's nice especially to see Dick Weiss. I think we met 40 years ago in a dingy high school gym somewhere, and I tried to convince him that we first met trying covering uh, Ralph Sampson in high school or Moses Malone in high school, and he said, no, nah, no, nah, it was Gene Banks. <laughs> so anyway, we covered some that weren't so good too. I asked Dave about my, my time allotment for my remarks. It works out to eight seconds for each of my 49 years at the Washington Post. Talk about a tight news hole. To show how appreciative I am, I'm going to break from character, and for once I promise I won't come in long and late. Where's George? Has he fainted yet? <laughs> Tolstoy wrote the famous lead, happy families are all alike. So he wrote about unhappy ones instead. By that standard, my story shouldn't take long because I've had a very happy career. I grew up on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. My mom, who was an ACC grad at Duke, was a baseball fan. We rode the streetcar to Griffith Stadium, which was way on the other side of town. When I was 13, RFK Stadium opened 15 blocks from my house, a miracle. It was like a sports spaceship had landed. Suddenly, I was a bike ride and a dollar and a quarter away for a bleacher seat away from watching every senator's game the entire summer. You could call it a formative experience. It's possible I still haven't overcome it. I'm lucky it wasn't a pool hall. So there I am. I live in the shadow of a gorgeous new stadium. I can go to the at least follow the skins or the gnats year round. And what arrives on our door every morning but the Washington Post, which is led by the elegant writing of Shirley Povich. So I, I assumed as a child that good sports writing was just good writing, and I still do. In retrospect, I've always sort of thought of it as a benevolent conspiracy on my behalf. Uh, my dad worked at the Library of Congress in DC, and he smuggled me into the stacks which was totally illegal for a 10 or 12 year old boy. And you'd see rows of book stalls that would go 50 yards into the distance and they'd, they'd come to a vanishing point in the distance. And my dad said to me, here is every book ever written about baseball. Don't go blind. That's my palestra. I graduated from Amherst College with a degree in English literature, the great refuge of the undecided. My parents had both asked me to follow any gift I had except to get be an English major, so of course, that was what I was. When it came to journalism, I was a walk-on. At 21, I asked for the lowest job in the sports department. That's what I got, the lowest job. Part-time copy boy on the lobster shift until 2 a.m., fetching coffee and burgers and changing typewriter ribbons. And that's just what I needed. In those years, Everything that I didn't know but had to learn was on real world display just an arm's length away from me. Back then, the sports department of the Post could be fit in a shoebox. Writers I had grown up reading were now telling me what they wanted in their coffee or could I put Jack Nicholas's phone call on hold until they finished talking to Muhammad Ali. Povich worked 15 feet away. I could hear his phone interviews. He was
was older than I am now, but I could see how much he still loved his job. Silk suit, tie loose and sense of humor, respected but giving respect, at ease with the people he covered but still digging for the story. Right in front of me were Dave Brady, Joan Ryan, and Bob Addy. Joan had been, she was, older, she was the first Joan Ryan and one of the earliest sports columnists. Bob Addy had played football for Bear Bryant and was married to Pauline Betts who had won Wimbledon twice. These were people who felt confident talking to the people they were interviewing. They covered the whole wa waterfront. All day they were on the phone with everybody who mattered in sports. I remember Don King, the promoter of fights who had the electrified hair, and Dave Brady wasn't, wasn't buying his pitch. Dave said, if you held that fight in my backyard, I'd close the blinds. Those days were rich in mentor, mentors, but they ended fast as, as George said, Don Graham became the sports editor for a year and he broke me out. When he arrived, I'd covered the same high school football game six years in a row, a meteoric rise. And I was still covering bicycle races at 5 a.m. and Maryland professors who claimed that they could throw a boomerang around the Washington Monument until I got there and they said, you don't think anybody can throw a boomerang around the Washington Monument, do you? I just wanted you to come cover my, my, uh, my session. Soon I was covering the 1975 World Series. Carlton Fisk, stay fair, stay fair. I've covered every World Series game since then. The next 28 years under George were a blur. He has that effect. By the 80s, I was his Orioles writer, national baseball writer, national boxing writer, national golf writer, national tennis writer, Georgetown Hoyas basketball writer, enterprise feature writer, and occasional columnist and I contributed a 5,000 word piece each month for Inside Sports, which was a post startup magazine. And every once in a while, I'd do some Redskins score stories to keep busy. During that time, during that time, I'm told that I married and had a son who's now 31. I can't confirm it. <laughs> However, I am sure I covered Earl Weaver for nine years. He was, he was my baseball graduate school. Usually we got along. But once in the World Series, Earl boycotted me. He not only refused to talk to me, he refused to talk if I was there. The next spring training, he said, my wife says I'm gonna go to hell if I don't talk to you. And I said, thanks Earl, but I don't have any questions right now. Oh, for just like two more moments like that in a lifetime. Asking questions matters, but what matters more to me anyway is watching and listening year after year, even decade after decade. You're gathering string, detail, anecdote, the kind of granular grasp of a subject that only total saturation usually brings with it until all those strings weave themselves together into an insight. An insight into what? You never know until you see it. Then you say that. That right there has to be incorporated in the portrait. For example, when my son Russ was eight years old, I took him and a friend of his named Drew to an Orioles game. We were getting out of the car and like a klutz, I closed the door on Drew's thumb. He bawled, I begged, Drew, what can I do from you? I'll do, I'll do anything. He stopped crying like that. Can you get me Cal Ripken's autograph? <laughs> We're not supposed to do that, but I was stuck. A few days later, I asked Cal to sign a ball for, for Drew. He said, I'll leave it in my, in my uh, locker between games of the doubleheader. And I said, you know, what's going on here? I've known Cal for years. He's, he's blowing me off. All he had to do was sign one ball out of the balls lying right there behind him. But I came back between games anyway. There was a ball in Ripken's locker covered in writing. It said, to Drew, I hope you feel better soon. Like my dad always says, it'll stop hurting before you're married twice. Cal Ripken. <laughs> He's, uh, Drew is now married and that ball is on the centerpiece of his mantle in his living room. Over a lifetime, 
It's the energizing, shocking surprise of sports in individuals, like Cal breaking Lou Gehrig's ref record by over 500 games. And in events you never thought you'd see. That's what constantly amazes you, keeps you energized, and why we still have people who want to get into this business. If you told me just 15 years ago that my future included covering both the cursed Red Sox and the cursed Cubs winning the World Series and baseball returning to my hometown and an all-star game in a modern park in two weeks and that the choking Washington Capitals would win the Stanley Cup but with the last game of the ice hockey season played in the middle of the Nevada desert I'd have said, wow, I get to keep working till I'm a thousand? <laughs> All my stories aren't such cheerful ones, just tonight. Athletes cross the same range of virtue and vice of human experience as the rest of us, the whole range. So over the years, the way you view athletes, the way you see all of sports, will come across in your stories or your columns. And it will unintentionally reveal exactly how you feel about everything. The reader knows that intuitively and knows it immediately. If you think you're judging others when you write, you're wrong. You're uncovering yourself. When I walked into the post, I had no idea of being a sports writer for life. It was almost a lark. But within months, I was hooked. I was home. Most days, it's been like eating fudge. Of course, not every day has been sweet. When I was 25, the managing editor of the Washington Post, Ben Bradley, didn't even know I worked at the Post. One day, news hit the wires that we would be sued for $8 million for my scoop in that morning's paper. It was about a well-known company involved in an Olympic ticket scam with kickbacks. I walked into Ben's office. I'd never met him. Is the story right? He introduced himself. Yes, I elaborated. You have one week to write a stronger story, Ben said. Thank you, I said. Obviously I did, because I'm still here tonight. What I said to Ben then, I want to say again tonight to everybody here. To all of you who are part of this admirable, demanding, challenged institution of journalism. Thank you for everything, for the satisfaction of being part of this enterprise for the last 49 years. Tonight, you've appreciated my work, but I'm the one who's grateful. Thank you.